Who here remembers Kyle Adams? Here's a quick clip to remind you. Which is an excellent topic for the month of April. So unless something suddenly changes, that is what our first lesson is going to be about. I don't think I want to learn about flat earth gardening. I'm going to vote cats. Here's the poll. Wouldn't it be great if cats won this poll? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Well, he has a very comprehensive series called Flat Earth Science, and we're going to delve into one of his lectures. It's a lecture on gravitational force, and it's quite unbelievable. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, I just want to point you in the direction of the Simon Dan podcast YouTube channel. Last week, we interviewed Gav from the Slow Mo Guys and we asked him about this famous video that the Flat Earthers so often use. It really was a fantastic chat. The link for that is in the description. Thank you. Right, on with today's video, where Carl Adams wants to tell us all about gravitational force in the context of flat earth science. Buckle up and get your face palm protection at the ready. You have been warned. All right, let's talk about gravitational force. Not too long ago, I had a conversation with an anti-flat earther by the name of MC Toon. Anti-flat earther, of course, is just a normal person. He told me that if the Earth was flat, gravity must not exist. Totally true, because a body large enough will form into a sphere under gravity's influence. So I asked him, what makes you think that? He said it had to do with something called the potato radius, and he provided a link that explained it in further detail. He said anything over a certain mass or size has enough mass to collapse into a spherical shape. Larger masses are more spherical. The critical size is between 200 and 300 kilometers, depending on the composition. And that is generally correct. Nice one, MC Toon. That made me think of the Rocky Mountains, which are 4,800 kilometers long. And so I asked, so you claim mountains should collapse into a spherical shape instead of a flat one? You showed the Rocky Mountains as a whole there, not a singular mountain. And besides, mountains are on Earth. They are part of Earth being spherical. Generally, from what I've seen, erosion causes mountains to level out, not turn into giant potatoes. The very fact that you're using this as an argument tells me that you are genuinely clueless. His response was, not mountains, the entire Earth. Well. So much for his 200 and 300 kilometer thing. Yes, because we're talking about actual planetary bodies here that don't have anything else interfering with them, gravitationally speaking. Mountains on the surface of the Earth kind of have the Earth interfering with them. I wanted to hear him out though. So I asked, if it all collapses, what is the determining factor that determines the central collapse point? And what makes you think that factor exists on the flat Earth model? To that, he did not have an answer for me. And that is where his straw man argument was exposed. Well, not really, because things don't collapse into a sphere from a flat disk. Planetary bodies and satellites coalesce over time, constantly adding new material from what we call an accretion disk when a new solar system is formed. At first, there's loads of what we call planetesimals flying around, or mini planets, and they go on to form the larger planetary bodies. As a body becomes larger and more massive, it becomes more spherical. Simple as that. The moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, are an excellent example of bodies which aren't quite big enough to become spherical. He was inventing his own model and saying, see, it doesn't work. Not too long after that, I went and took the same questions to another anti-flat earther that I know, by the name of Mr. Sensible. And thankfully, he was quite a bit more sensible with me. When I asked him, where is the middle center of gravity on the flat Earth? He said, well, depends on the model, I guess. Say a disk with an ice wall, then the center would be the North Pole, then halfway through the thickness. 
This is technically true, but under gravity as we know it, the Earth would never be in that sort of model, so... That left me to ask, that depends on whether or not the Earth stops at the ice wall, doesn't it? Also, isn't density a factor on where the center of gravity is? If I had a weight attached to one end of a ruler, I couldn't say that the center of gravity on that ruler is still in the center of that ruler. And that is where he refocused things and said, the point is, wherever the center is, gravity would be pulling things toward it and everything would collapse into a sphere. And that is where his straw man came out. According to his model, there was no way his flat earth could have a balanced center of gravity. Which goes back to MC Toon's point. If flat earth was to exist, then gravity cannot under its current understanding. Now, something that really stood out to me about both of their descriptions of gravity was how they both described it as a force that pulls on things. This directly disagrees with what Einstein taught us about gravity. Well, it kind of doesn't, because at these levels we can describe gravity as acting like a force. According to Einstein, one of the happiest moments in his life was when he realized gravity and acceleration are the same thing. As physics of the universe paraphrases, gravity is in reality not a force at all, but is indistinguishable from, and in fact, the same thing as acceleration. Okay, great, but we're experiencing that acceleration here on Earth. And to us, we can consider it a force at the macro scale. Newton's equations do work at this scale. Here's a little clip from Nova that talks about that. Yes, 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 Carl, we do know that Newton and Einstein don't agree on what gravity is. However, that doesn't mean that the Earth isn't spherical. This is why we refer to the acceleration we feel in a car as g-force. And I see no reason why acceleration would not be able to exist on the flat Earth. But Einstein's gravity is a bend in the space-time caused by the mass of objects. The same reason that planets become spherical after a certain mass. You cannot sit there and say that acceleration can be a thing on flat Earth, because that acceleration is governed by the same rules that we apply to everything else when we talk about gravity. It won't work. The last time I checked, G-force doesn't care what shape the Earth is. Although, if Einstein is right, and the Earth's gravity effect is being caused by the Earth's acceleration, that could create some problems for the globe Earth model. Oh, could it now, Kyle? This is an instance where gravity, which is acceleration, would not cause water to stick to a ball. Unless, of course, the Earth is accelerating outward in all directions, in which case the Earth would have to be perpetually exploding. At this point, I often get people who shallowly say, yeah, well, you just don't understand. And they would be bang on there, Kyle. You don't. This is where gravity is described as a fictitious force. And yes, fictitious here directly means non-existent, pretend, or imaginary. It is just like Coriolis force and centrifugal force. We can describe them. We can say what they do to other things. We can measure them, predict things with them. But these forces themselves do not exist. They are caused by something else. The rotation of the Earth, Carl. You know, the thing that you think isn't moving. All right. So this, it turns out there's no such thing as centrifugal force. It's the word we give to this thing that feels like a force operating on you if you are the water in that bucket. Or if you're in that amusement park where, I think they call it the cyclone, where you're sort of pinned against this, the wall of it and it rotates and you feel this pressure increase on you. So anyhow, so this centrifugal force, you will feel it as though it's a real force. And so that's why we gave it a name, all right? And by, by the way, Coriolis force is another fictitious force. It feels like it's a real force operating, but it's the product of other things going on. The Coriolis force turns storms into... In a clockwise... In, 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 in a counterclockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise direction. In the north and clockwise in the south. And I'm sure he has an explanation for all of that. Oh, and it does, he seems. Perhaps we should take a look at that next time and watch him come up with more ridiculous arguments. Well, there we go, a wonderful example of a flat earther starting an argument and then not actually finishing that argument. 
The fact remains that on a flat Earth, gravity as we know it cannot exist. That's all we've got time for today on Flat Earth Friday. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please do consider subscribing. It'd be very much appreciated. And like the video as well, please. I have been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great weekend. And I'll see you all on Tuesday for the return of Hans. See you then.